Hello, how are you? Welcome to Hot Tea with Holly. I am Holly and I got some hot tea and it says you are awesome. Hello, hello, how are you? It is January 4th, January 4th, I believe. And happy new year to you. If you're watching this in playback, this was taped on January 4th and I'm having a hot cup of tea. If you are joining me for a hot beverage, I hope you'll share. What are you drinking? Today, I am drinking another Big Heart Tea Company. This is the Rosy and Bright. Um, my friend Erin actually gifted this to me. I think it was for my birthday, which was so sweet. And this is a cheerful spiced rose black tea. Now, I don't normally like to drink rose. I don't mind rose in perfume, but I generally don't love rose in a tea. And so we're going to see how it is. I have not had it yet. Don't love it. I'll be honest. <laughs> don't love it. I don't taste the rose, but I am getting a lot of hibiscus. Hibiscus, rose, cinnamon. That's why the cinnamon you can't combine cinnamon and rose, people, right? Cinnamon is just way too strong of a flavor to combine it with rose. This is a miss for me. I like the black tea in it. I like the cinnamon. I like the hibiscus, but the rose is not coming through. So there you have it. You, you win some and you lose some, but it is a beautiful dark red black tea, which is nice if you like cinnamon, if you like hibiscus. This is a really nice combo for you, but it definitely does not taste like rose to me. I'm missing the rose spices. Anyway, welcome. How are you? Julie, how are you? Ooh, Julie is having a homemade peppermint patty tea. I am sharing this recipe. Okay, peppermint tea with one teaspoon of cocoa powder and one teaspoon of honey. That is pretty brilliant. I've never even thought of that. That sounds amazing. And what's also nice about that is it's a peppermint tea with a little bit of cocoa powder in it, or you could probably even put raw cacao, which would be so nice because it's it's going to be decaf, well, it's going to be uncaffeinated herbal, which just a little bit of cocoa in it is going to give you a little bit of a, of a cocoa caffeine punch. So I'm down with that. Julie, so good to have you here and thank you for sharing. Petrina is having hibiscus tea. I'm with you, my girl. Those of you that like hibiscus, you like it, you love it or hate it. Um, I'm kind of, I'm, I'm a little on the fence with hibiscus too. I like it. It's not my favorite, but depending on how it's blended, I will enjoy it. And I don't mind it with a strong black tea, which this is. So it's nice. Welcome. Amy, so good to have you. Lavender Earl Grey. You guys are getting really creative. I love this. Lavender Earl Grey. Love it. Irene is having blueberry green tea. Love it. What else do we have? Mary. Hello, Mary. How are you? Happy New Year to you. I've missed you. Bigelow green tea turmeric. Another good combination. Oh, my goodness. Judy Tate. Hello. Heidi is having, oh, Heidi is having watermelon electrolyte rehydration mix. Oh, by BioSteel. I don't know this one, but I am definitely loving the, uh, Ultima Replenisher watermelon, watermelon flavor, which is absolutely my favorite in terms of hydration drinks. Let's jump in. Today, I've got an incredible conversation for you. So here's the deal. Every single woman should be committed to a strength training program. This is not my opinion. There's so much research to support it. Now, if you don't enjoy strength training or you haven't adopted it yet, that's okay. But the truth is when we look at the research that's out there and when I look back upon my 30 years in the industry, I can tell you without a doubt, strength training is the best, most effective way to improve your health, transform your body, eliminate injury, uh, eliminate aches and pains and completely eliminate the risk of injury. It's the best way to boost energy and stamina, and it will also help to balance out your hormones. Strength training is hands down the best 
the most effective way of achieving those things. That's why my whole career is committed to it. So today I'm bringing you nine essential exercises that I believe every single woman should be doing. And I'm going to attach to that the weight loads that we would deem the minimum effective dosage. So what this means is these are the nine exercises that need to be in your weekly routine. And it's the weight loads that I want you to strive to achieve at some point in your future. Now, some of these weight loads, you might already be able to do them. Some of them might be very far ahead of you. It doesn't matter. Your job is to take these nine exercises, incorporate them into your week somehow, and set out on a path to achieve the minimum effective dosage. This is the weight load that you need to be able to do at a bare minimum. Now, you can certainly do weight loads that are heavier. I'm not saying that once you reach these weight loads, your job is over. What I'm saying is, in my experience now of coaching women for 30 years, on top of a degree in exercise physiology and nutrition, on top of being a certified strength and conditioning specialist, on top of being the author of the Bible of strength training for women, my book, Live to Get Lean, right here, on top of all of those things, this is what I see are the nine exercises and the nine weight loads that you need to be able to do to really create the body that you need to live the life that you already love. You're going to be walking through a life in this physical body. And the more you take care of it, the better your life is going to be. This part's not my opinion. This has already been documented by myriad research. There's so much research out there to support this. So I'm going to share with you the nine exercises that are absolutely essential and the weight loads that you want to achieve at some point. I love this conversation. I've been wanting to do it for a while. So let's officially jump in. Grab your notebook, write it down because I want you to get started working on these nine exercises ASAP. Number one, not in any particular order. Number one is goblet squat. Now, the alternate to goblet squat could be a leg press, but I'm going to go with goblet squat because I do believe that an upright, weight-bearing, closed kinetic chain exercise like a squat is something that every single one of us needs to be doing. Why? Because at some point in your life, you need to crouch down and stand up. And that goes beyond just sitting down into a chair. So have you ever had to get down on your hands and knees, look under a bed, or maybe dig in the back of your closet and find a box and you have to get down on your hands and knees and then you need to stand up with that box? Now, that might be easy for you and me now, but when you're 72 or 78 or 84 or 97... This is a really important movement pattern, and goblet squat is my favorite squat variation for women for a number of reasons. One, I love the foot position because it's a little bit more um, forgiving on the unique structure of a woman's body, the way that we use our legs, uh, the way that we use our glutes, the positioning and the rotation of our pelvis and our hip structure in general. I find goblet squat is just such a great productive, but also accessible squat movement pattern. And some of the other squat movement patterns are particularly clunky. A barbell front squat, a barbell back squat, even a dumbbell squat, I find is a bit clunkier than a goblet squat. It's so doable for everyone. Now, I have women in my community. Shout out to Carmen. Are you here? I have women in my community in their 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s. I don't know if I've got anyone in their 80s. I believe that I do, but I can tell you this. I've got women in all of those 
um, decades of life doing goblet squat. It's absolutely one of the best exercises that you want to be doing. So what's the weight load? What is the minimum effective dosage? Let me repeat, just in case you're hopping in now, I'm going to be giving you the nine exercises and the nine weight loads that are the bare minimum effective dosage. And what this means is this is the minimum resistance amount that you want to accomplish, that you want to check off the list. And by no means am I saying I want you to stop at these weight loads. I want you to keep progressing beyond some of these weight loads. But this is the bare minimum. You've got to be able to do a goblet squat, body weight plus 30 pounds at a bare minimum, at a bare minimum. And I might even say that number is 35 or even 40 pounds, but I thought long and hard about these numbers that I selected. And this is based on my experience. This is not based on any research. I don't even know if we could create research around this topic, but this is off of my 30 years of, of training women and also being a woman myself. Goblet squat, your own body weight plus an additional 30 pounds. So what that looks like generally is it's going to be a 30 pound kettlebell or dumbbell. Now it could be two 15 pound kettlebells. It could be two 15 pound dumbbells put together, but generally a goblet squat is easiest and most productive when you're using one weight load. And that would be 30 pounds. Write that down. Now, if you're already at 30 pounds, high five, check that one off your list. But I do want you to continue to progress beyond 30 pounds. Heidi, where are you with your goblet squat? If you don't mind sharing, who else is here? Jennifer, if you're here, maybe Mary, if you want to share, um, I'll share where I am right now. But, you know, Heidi, I think Heidi is up to 45, 55 pounds. If you'll share with us where, if you're still here with me. So I'm not saying that 30 pounds is where you want to stop. It's actually where you want to start. So if this is a new movement pattern for you, you might start with five pounds or maybe 10 pounds and gradually over time, progressively, I want you to inch yourself up to 30 pounds on your goblet squat, comfortably doable for approximately at least a set of 12 to 15 repetitions. And that is the bare minimum effective dosage that you're really going to be able to get all the benefits from strength training on this particular movement pattern, goblet squat. Heidi, let's see, is she still here? Uh, she's not here. Mary Tanny's at 25 pounds. Currently, I'm at only... I'm at 30 pounds myself right now. I could probably do it a little bit heavier. Um, I'm limited by my exercise equipment right now. So I've got to get some more exer exercise equipment to get beyond 30 pounds. But right now I'm at 30 pounds and that's a little light for me. But again, it's just like I said, it's the minimum effective dosage. It's the smallest amount that you're really going to feel the benefits of your strength training. Number two, can you guess? I'm curious if any of you guys can guess some of my nine exercises. Number two, again, not in any particular order. Number two is a dumbbell side raise. Love a dumbbell side raise. And that's because it is a mechanically disadvantaged movement pattern. So because you have this lever length, your arm, and you add a weight load to the end of that lever length, when you're going through a dumbbell side raise, it's a very challenging exercise. It's a great exercise to safely, conservatively strengthen the deltoids as the primary muscle mover, as well as some of the other accessory muscles around your shoulder. But your medial deltoid is the biggest of the shoulder muscles, and particularly of the deltoids, there's three deltoids, but specifically of the muscles that um, direct the movement around the shoulder, your medial deltoid is the biggest, the most powerful, and it's the one that needs the most love. Now, this is also the muscle that creates a beautiful shoulder. This is the muscle that makes you look more athletic. And this is the muscle 
that inserts mid arm and tends to create some of that really nice definition through your arm and your biceps. This is the the muscle that I often refer to when women say to me, I want my arms to look cut. I want to have good looking biceps and triceps. I actually have them work on their deltoids because by developing your deltoids, the rest of your arms look amazing and you don't have to put as much effort into your biceps and triceps because the deltoid will make your arm look incredible. So exercise number two of the nine is dumbbell side raise and the minimum effective dosage here is eight pounds, an eight pound dumbbell with excellent technique. So what you're going to find is that when you make the transition from five pounds to eight pounds on a dumbbell side raise, that's a big shift. Most, almost all of the women in my, in my community, if they were with me here in the gym and I guided them, they could do a five pound dumbbell side raise for a solid set of 15 repetitions. But when we go from five to eight, that is where I start to see um, technique loss for a lot of women. So the sidebar, the side note to this exercise on dumbbell side raise is I want you to be able to do one full set of 15 repetitions with eight pounds comfortably with excellent technique, excellent technique. Okay. That's really important because you could muscle through 10 pounds of this exercise. And I see this all the time in my community where women are like, I'm doing 15 pounds on my, on my dumbbell side raise. And I'm like, mm, send me a video. Let me double check that because there aren't a lot of women that are doing a 15 pound dumbbell side raise with beautiful technique. And as you know, I am all about technique first. Technique trumps everything. It's rule number one in my book, Lift to Get Lean. Trump, Trump, uh, uh, technique trumps everything. And so for exercise number two and the minimum effective dosage of eight pounds, I want you to really be learning your dumbbell side raise with gorgeous technique. Now today we're not really talking about what gorgeous technique means. We can talk about that in other conversations, but this will at least get you started. If you're here with me live, please say hello. If you're having a cup of tea, mm, what are you having? Mm. Rona is here. Heidi's here. Okay. So guys, Heidi, just to circle back around, um, Heidi is at 65 pounds on her goblet squat. And so I share that to brag about her a little bit. Yes, of course. She's a bad ass for sure. But more importantly is just to demonstrate basically the range. I definitely want you hitting 30 pounds, but that 30 pounds could head on up even beyond 65 pounds. Once you get up to about 45 or 55 or even 65 pounds on your goblet squat, you're going to notice major changes in how your body feels, how you move through life, how you perform in your other workouts. It's really going to improve your life and your mechanics so much. So again, the numbers that I'm sharing with you today are what I refer to as a minimum effective dose, meaning you got to hit this at a bare minimum in order to avoid injury, age gracefully, transform your body into the aesthetic that you're looking for, to perform better, to optimize hormones, to reduce aches and pains, boost energy, so many benefits to this. These are the minimum effective doses. Okay. Number three, again, not in any particular order. Those of you guys that are um, familiar friends here inside of Hot Tea with Holly or in my community in general, this one will come to no surprise because this is probably in my top four exercises. So if I had to whittle the nine down to like four, I think this would be in the top four. And that is drum roll. Cable, lat, pull down. <sighs> cable, lat, pull down. Cable, lat, pull down will always have my heart. It is the most important back exercise that you can do. It's number one for your back. And now I could go on and on and on why that is. We could talk for an hour why that is. I'm going to try to keep it to a minimum here. But the reason why is that this 
downward action. It is a downward pull at a slight angle of your torso strengthens the major muscle mover is your latissimus dorsi, your lats, which is the largest muscle of your upper back. But the reason why I love this one so much is because your latissimus dorsi, your lats originate, they begin down at your waist. They come up and they insert on the top of your arm. So when you do a lat pull down, I tend to like a reverse grip, but either a wide grip or a reverse grip lat pull down. When you do it properly and you really get your um, technique down, it improves the function, the stability, and the safety of your entire shoulder girdle as it relates to core function. I could go on and on about lat pull down. Ah, top three, maybe even, you have to be doing a lat pull down. Now, if you're someone like me who does not work out in a commercial gym, you might not have a lat cable lat pull down machine. So there is an alternate, which is a proper chin up. Now, I don't know if you can see my chin up bar. Nope, you can't see it. Hold on. Let me show you. My chin up bar is right there. So right here, that's my chin up bar. And you'll see I got my green band tucked up in there. And the reason why I have it tucked up in there is so that you don't see it on my camera. <laughs> but my green band is up there because that is how I am um, substituting a, lap, uh, a chin up for a lat pull down. So if you are absolutely not able to do a cable lat pull down, for whatever reason, you're not going to a commercial gym or your home gym doesn't have a cable lat pull down. I might get one. The alternate here is a chin up. Now, chin up is reverse grip facing you here. I feel very strongly that women should master a chin up before they go to a pull up. So master your chin up first, and most women are not going to be able to just hop up on a chin up bar with their full body weight and do a full set of the minimum effective dose of chin ups, which I'll tell you in a moment, with excellent technique. So if you are not able to do a lat pull down and you are learning to do a body weight chin up, you will get there progressively by using an assisted band. So this band comes down, I put my foot into it, and it's how I have the band assist me in doing a chin-up until I'm strong enough and back to the technique of being able to do my chin-ups body weight only. I'm probably there right now, but I couldn't do a full minimum effective dose set of body weight chin-ups just yet. And so I'm using a, a resistance band to help make that happen. The minimum effective dose, cable, lat, pull down, reverse grip, or overhand wide grip, 70 pounds. Now, every cable lat pull down machine is gonna be a little different. So your machine might be a little heavier. Your machine might be a little lighter. It's around 70 pounds. That could range from 55 to 85, depending on your gym equipment. But in all the gyms that I've been in, on all the cable lat pull down machines I've ever used, 70 pounds is about the sweet spot where it's like, yep, that's the weight load. That is the minimum effective dose where if you can master it, you're going to see the benefits all over your life. Pulling exercises are so important because it's how you pull your body up against gravity. And it's an important movement pattern to really optimize your posture. So cable lat pull down, minimum effective dose, 70 pounds with great technique comfortably for one set of 15 reps. And if you can do more than that, great. But that's kind of the minimum effective dose. I want you to get up to a full set of 15, great technique, mostly comfortable at 70 pounds. And if you're working with the alternate chin-ups, the goal, the minimum effective dose, is to get to your full body weight alone for 10 chin-ups. And that's a stretch. 
That's challenging for most people. Please don't go to your gym and just hop up on there and just try it if you haven't been practicing. Um, 10 body weight pull-ups on your own is the minimum effective dose. And once you're able to do that, you're going to see the benefits all over your life. Number four, again, in no particular order, is another beloved traditional barbell deadlift. Not, can be, not to be confused with a Romanian deadlift or what's called a stiff leg or a straight leg deadlift. This is a traditional deadlift where the bar is below you and you've got knee and hip flexion. So both your knees and your hips are lowering you to the ground before you stand back up. Always with a, well, not always, but I would say ideally it would be with a barbell. I did not give a dumbbell variation of this because I ultimately want you to be doing a barbell deadlift, ultimately. Uh, if you work out at home exclusively, I understand that you might not be able to do a barbell, but I am kind of moving into um, the belief that no matter where you're working out, even if you are working out at home, irrespective of, of your age, I want everyone working with a dumbbell, a barbell, sorry. I want every woman working with a barbell. And again, if you're in my community, and certainly if you're inside of one of my programs like um, the Masters or the Next Level or potentially the Glutes Project, you know that I'm this year have been really providing a lot of information on how to make a barbell deadlift more accessible, even if you're working out at home. So in a perfect ideal world, this is a barbell deadlift and the minimum effective dose is 85 pounds for one set of 15 with great technique where you can do that set comfortably. If you can do 15 repetitions of a barbell deadlift at 85 pounds and you can do it comfortably, you are in a good place. Now, people hop in and out of these live feeds. And so if you are here with me live and you just jumped in, it is important to say, I'm not saying that 85 pounds is where you should stop. I'm saying that's more the minimum effective dose. I want every woman on the planet to be able to do a barbell deadlift for 15 repetitions at 85 pounds. And if we could all do that, the world would be a much happier place. <laughs> and I can promise you will be a much happier person because this is an essential movement pattern. Number five, another one of my tried and true single leg deadlift. And that is different than the barbell deadlift. Number four, a single leg deadlift is quite different, and it's actually more like a single leg Romanian deadlift, technically, but we call it a single leg deadlift, okay? Single leg SLDL is what I refer to it as, single leg deadlift. And um, it does require you to learn the movement pattern. You want to make sure that you're employing excellent technique on this exercise, for sure, absolutely, without a doubt. Minimum effective dose. If you're following the way that I teach single leg deadlift, I offset the weight load. So what that means is you hold one dumbbell when you are working on the opposite leg. If you're standing on your left leg, you hold the dumbbell in your right hand. It's an offset, basically. And that is what I teach. You can do it with two dumbbells. You can do it with a barbell. But what I'm teaching here is a single dumbbell because that's the best way to gradually, progressively improve and get up to the minimum effective dose, which is a 15-pound dumbbell for 15 repetitions on each leg. That is where you're really going to start to see the power and the value and the influence of strength training in your life. When you start to hit these weight loads that I'm talking about today, you'll start to notice that you feel better going up and down stairs. You'll start to notice that when you pick up something heavy, it's a whole lot easier. Or even simple things like trying to open, let's say, a jar of something that's really tight, you'll start to notice that activities of daily living just become so much easier when you hit these minimum effective dose weight levels for these nine important 
exercises. Number six is a straight arm plank. Now, I don't talk about planks a whole lot. I do program them into my programs like the Glutes Project. Uh, we don't have ones inside of the Masters right now, but next level usually in almost all my programs, definitely the comeback. In most of my programs, there's almost always a plank in there. That is because I actually am not convinced that traditional ab exercises are all that important or effective. Now, I'm not going to say don't do them, but when you are mastering everything else that I teach, when you're mastering the other eight exercises that I'm talking about today, and you get up to this minimum effective dose, this minimum weight load on each of these exercises, you're going to start to see that your core gets strengthened and that typical isolated ab exercises like crunches and bicycles aren't as important. I'm not saying negate them. I'm just saying I'm not convinced they're all that important when you're hitting these weight loads on your goblet squat or your deadlift or your single leg deadlift or your lat pull down. A heavy lat pull down is incredible for your core. And so it ends up um, kind of reducing the importance and the value of typ typical crunchy crunch type ab exercises. That all being said, I do think plank type exercises are valuable. So straight arm isometric plank, which is different than a bent arm isometric plank. And the reason for that is with a straight arm, it really does pull in the value and the importance of the bi biomechanics of your wrist, your forearms, your elbows, and your shoulders in a much more um, functional way in life as compared to being on your elbows for a plank, okay? So I do feel that it's a straight arm plank, which starts to draw in shoulder function, of course, technique is absolutely critical, and I am talking about legs extended, the top of a military push-up, legs extended, feet together, two minutes nonstop is the minimum effective dose on a plank, and it could certainly be longer. Again, if you are here with me today and some of these exercises are newer for you, um, and you hear me say this. Please don't run over to your living room and see if you can do a two minute plank if you haven't been practicing your plank. And this applies to all of these exercises. Like, don't get excited about this conversation and go, let me see if I can do 10 body weight pull ups, if you chin ups, if you haven't been practicing these things. Okay. I want you to be able to do these things every single week on an ongoing basis comfortably as part of your training program. This isn't just like, oh, I can do a, a two minute plank check. I never have to do it again. It's that these should be in your weekly training program every single week. These are the nine most essential strength training exercises that you need to be doing every single week for the rest of your life. If you can, what I'm saying is every single week, you really should be able to do at least a two minute plank and or more, right? And that is going to be that minimum effective dose where you're going to get all of the benefits of that exercise. Number seven, this one is also in my top three. It is hard. It would be real hard for me to select my top three. It's hard. We already picked one of them right? Lat pull down is definitely on the list. This one's definitely on the list. I'm not sure what number three would be, but number two on that list and number seven on today's list is walking lunges. Walking lunges. I love walking lunges. I think that they are absolutely one of the most important exercises. Every single woman should be doing them. And I realize you might be sitting there saying, but my doctor told me not to do them because they're bad for my knees. 
I understand that that is a comment that's floating out there in the world. And I hear you. You are the boss of you. You are the, you know, you have dominion over your body and you can take this up with your doctor if you want. From my perspective, again, 30 years in the industry and highly credentialed, I very much believe that a healthy human body is able to do walking lunges. And if you can't do walking lunges because they bother your knees, that's because you haven't been doing walking lunges. Okay, follow? If you can't squat because it hurts your knees, that's because you haven't been squatting. That's because you haven't hit these minimum effective doses that I'm talking about here today. And I know that might be a little scary to some people. And I know that might sort of, you know, stir the pot for some people, but there's a lot of research to back it up. And I'm not the only one in my industry that will say it. Go check out your favorite physical therapist or athletic trainer out there. They will say the same thing. And here is why. A walking lunge or a goblet squat, actually a walking lunge even more so, is the exaggerated movement pattern of climbing a flight of stairs or going down a flight of stairs. So if you're going to tell me that you're never going to climb a flight of stairs again in your life, okay, maybe you don't have to do walking lunges. But if you're never, ever going to climb even one stair in the rest of your life, you've got to be doing walking lunges. It is an incredible movement pattern. And yes, just like the other nine exercises that I'm talking about today, you've got to do it with good technique. I am not telling you to do these exercises with terrible technique to just check them off the box to say, Holly said I needed to be able to do this many walking lunges. I could do it. No, it's that you can do it in a repeatable fashion week after week after week. And it's where your fitness level is. It's where your current ability lives week after week after week after week after week after week. And you've got to really be focusing on doing all of these with excellent technique. This is not achieve these numbers at the cost of your technique. It's get your technique first. And then when you can achieve these doses, dosages, right? Then you're going to be bulletproof. You're going to be so much more functional. You're not going to have knee pain. You're not going to have shoulder pain when you reach these movement patterns with perfect technique on a consistent basis. Walking lunges, body weight, nonstop for five minutes. That is right. And that is a lot. I believe every woman in order to be optimally fit, strong, resilient, and injury proof, every single woman should be able to do five minutes, body weight only, nonstop walking lunges with beautiful technique. One set. I personally do one, sometimes two sets of 15 minutes of nonstop body weight walking lunges. I do that at least once a week. Sometimes I do it twice a week. Sometimes I'll do a 15 minute and then I'll do a shorter minute. Oh, by the way, if you are here with me live or watching in playback and you haven't joined me for a free Saturday workout, come on over to hollyperkins.com forward slash free workout. You can sign up and join us totally free every Saturday. I do a live workout um, and you can join us. You have to sign up because I don't do it here on Facebook live. I don't do it anywhere. It is a private zoom link. So you do have to sign up to have access to this workout, but we do workshop walking lunges every single Saturday because this is a movement pattern that I think is super, super important. So if you haven't already joined me for a free live workout, Come on over to my website, hollyperkins.com, add a forward slash free workout, put your name and your email in, and you can join us this weekend. I am here providing this free service almost every single weekend, and it would be so fun to have you there. Walking lunges, body weight only, five minutes. Number eight on the list, and I will circle back around for any questions for those of you guys that are here with me live. 
Number eight's another controversial exercise. This is another one that's up there with walking lunges. This is another one that's up there with goblet squat. And this is another one that's up there on my top five. Maybe not in the top three, but definitely in the top five. Number eight of the nine movement patterns that you've got to be doing. Barbell overhead press. Yes, she just said it. She did say it. I did. And there's a lot of controversy over this movement pattern because there are some people in the industries that feel that overhead pressing is tricky on your shoulders. And I'm not going to I'm not going to argue that. I do agree that overhead pressing is a complicated movement pattern. It absolutely is. And if you have a history of shoulder issues, you have to workshop this exercise at a lower weight load with beautiful, perfect technique. And here's why. Again, you might be sitting there thinking, you know, I dislocated my shoulder in high school basketball. And ever since my doctor, my doctor has told me that I'm not allowed to do overhead pressing exercises. We've all heard that, right? A lot of us have heard that. But let me ask you this. Do you think there might be a point in your life, at some point in your whole life ahead of you, where you have to pick up something kind of heavy and put it up on a shelf? Or do you have a child or a pet? or a grandchild that you want to pick up and put them up or play with them or lift them up or throw them up in the air, right? Is there ever going to come a time in your life where you need to pick up something that weighs more than two or three pounds and you need to put it up on a shelf? If you ever plan to travel, do you ever plan to put an over a bag into the overhead compartment on a flight? So at some point in your life, you're going to have to make this movement pattern. And that is why we strengthen the movement pattern. Now, I personally, this is personal opinion and experience. I do love a barbell overhead press for a number of reasons. I do have colleagues in the industry who say it doesn't have to be a barbell. It could be dumbbells. And I'll give you that. I'll go with that. If your doctor is like, Sally, do not do a barbell overhead press. That's cool, but you're never going to win me over saying that you shouldn't at least do a dumbbell overhead press. Because again, it's like I said with walking lunges, a healthy human body is designed to put their arms up over their head and say, yay, right? You're designed to be able to do this. And if you have limited shoulder function and you get pain when you do this, that's because we haven't fixed you yet. That's because your shoulders aren't fully functional yet. And that's because you haven't been perfecting your technique on an overhead press. So maybe you start with three pound dumbbells, right? And then maybe you work yourself up to five pound dumbbells. And then maybe when you get to 10 pound dumbbells, you transition to a 15 pound barbell and then you get better and you ref you over time strengthen and improve your technique overhead pressing with a barbell minimum effective dose is going to shock you here from my perspective being an expert in my field you can't take that away from me 35 pounds i feel every single woman should take as long as she needs in life to be able to achieve one set, 15 reps, 35 pounds of a barbell. That's the combined weight that you are moving. So if your barbell weighs 15 pounds, you would add a 10 and a 10, right? That's 35, if I'm adding correctly, yeah. If your barbell is 15 pounds, you would put a 10 and a 10, now your barbell weighs 35 pounds in total, one set of 15 repetitions with perfect technique. Now, some of you might already be able to do that. Some of you might not even be able to put your arm up over your head comfortably. And so it's going to be a journey. It's going to be maybe even a two-year adventure to get you up to 35-pound barbell press. And again, you got to be able to do it with good, te good technique. But I know your life is 
going to be better. I know you're going to feel better. I know that you're going to avoid upper body injuries more if you're able to do this minimum effective dose of a barbell overhead press. And exercise number nine, I actually debated on this one. I actually had a different exercise in number nine. And then at the last minute, I was like, no, nope, I got to change this because this one is also in the top five for sure, because this is so absolutely essential, just like a walking lunge, step ups, whether that's onto an exercise bench or a chair or even your stairwell, a step up. Now, step ups like lat pull down are a very important exercise movement pattern. It's absolutely essential, absolutely essential. A step up is what we call a level change exercise. So what that means is you're taking yourself from a level and you're pushing yourself up to another level. You're stepping up onto something. And you can only reinforce or strengthen that movement pattern specifically by doing a step up. Okay. I do it on an exercise bench. You could do it onto any surface, but it's important that you are moving your body weight from one level to a new level. Why is that important? Again, it's like I said, with walking lunges, unless you're going to tell me that you're never going to climb a flight of stairs ever again in your life, unless you're going to tell me that, you need to be doing step ups. And if you can guarantee that you're never going to do climb a flight of stairs or come down a flight of stairs, then you can skip this. But that's just not going to happen. And so as we age, as we get older, if you don't want the activities of daily living to be taken away from you, we all know someone who's older that really struggles going up and down stairs. And we all know that that is a huge risk of injury as we're getting older. In fact, you know, a lot of older, you know, people as they are aging and as they are deciding on their sort of final living arrangements for life, a lot of people choose single level homes for this very reason to eliminate stairs, having to go up and down stairs. And that's totally fine and okay. But wouldn't life be a whole lot better if you could fly up and down a flight of stairs, a piece of cake? I mean, that sounds good to me. When I'm 90 or 94, I want to be able to go up and down stairs easily, safely, comfortably. And a bench step up or a step up of any type of step up is going to help you do that. So if you're not doing this movement pattern, why would you be able to climb a flight of stairs with good technique or strongly or safely if you're not practicing it? It's virtually impossible. Now, walking lunges and a goblet squat will help you but there's something called specificity and movement pattern. There is a very specific movement pattern of climbing a flight of stairs. It's called a level change. And so a version of a bench step up is one of the best ways that you can do this. Minimum effective dose is body weight plus 30 pounds, one set of 15 repetitions on each leg. So you could do body weight plus 15 pound dumbbells for a total of 30. You could do body weight plus a 30 pound barbell, 15 repetitions on each leg. So one set again with great technique. And now again, you might be sitting there saying, but it really bothers my knees. Stepping up really, or even going downstairs really bothers my knees. And I hear you, that is a reason to be careful. That is a reason to practice. That is a reason to gradually work yourself up to this minimum effective dose. I'm not telling you to go do it right now. I promise if you commit to and you take the time to learn these nine exercises with beautiful technique, and then over time, you increase the resistance, the effort level of each of these nine exercises, I promise you that at some point in the future, that knee pain will go away. That hip pain will go away. The shoulder issues will go away. It might take a very long time and 
if you've had traumatic injury in your past, like a car accident or, um, you know, severe trauma to a joint, you might not be able to get rid of aches and pains 100%. But I promise that if you commit to these with excellent technique over time, a lot of those things are going to at least get down to the bare minimum. I'll never forget when I was in my early 20s, uh, probably 22. And I was in New York City. I was a trainer at a very famous um, fitness facility, but it was also a medically oriented health and wellness fitness facility. Um, this was back in the day when I was training Howard Stern and Julia Roberts and um, Natasha Richardson and Courtney Love and Kelly Klein. I mean, this was like, I was training like the A-listers at the time. And I'll never forget I had severe knee pain every time I went down the stairs. I was 22. Knee pain. I went to the orthopedic surgeon for the New York Nick. No, no, the New York Rangers, the hockey team. And he was like, yep, you got bad knees. You got arthritis and you need, you need to have surgery. I was 22. And I was like, mm, this isn't sitting for me. I'm like, let me see if I can go fix it on my own. I hired a physical therapist. And we got to work and I was 22 at the time. I could barely sit through a movie because my knees hurt so much. I had excruciating knee pain going downstairs. Here I am nearly 30 years later, 28 years later, and my knees are bulletproof, bulletproof. My knees are better than they ever were in my entire life right now because of everything that I just shared with you. So for those of you that are a little nervous, who it makes you a little uncertain if you've got issues with shoulder joints, knee joints, hip joints, I hear you. And I'm not telling you to, to ignore this. I'm telling you to commit to an adventure ahead where you appropriately and safely and accurately rehabilitate your joints through strength training, with excellent technique. So as I said, the, you know, the underscore to this whole conversation is that you are learning perfect technique with all of these exercises. It's critical. And now I know I'm going to come over to comments here in a moment. I realize you might be like, well, how do I know if I'm doing it right? How do I know what excellent technique looks like? I hear you. And that is a bit of a commitment. That is an education process. There is a learning curve. And this is exactly why I created Strength Society. So Strength Society is a live workshop that I offered for the first time last year, 2021. And this is exactly why, because I was like, okay, people need to really learn how, what good technique looks like. And it's why I created Strength Society. Um, I don't foresee any Strength Society live workshops uh, coming in the month of January, maybe later this year, there will be. But if this is something that you want to commit to, um, you are able to purchase access to the recordings of all of the three past Strength Societies. Just go to my website, hollyperkins.com forward slash strength society. You can also just go to my homepage and at the top, you'll see programs and you can drop down and go over to Strength Society. And you can look and see because a lot of these exercises, not all of them, but a lot of them, one, two, three, four, five, six of them, six of these nine exercises I have already covered in Strength Society. I've already covered it. So six of these nine, uh, yeah, I haven't done plank and I haven't done dumbbell side raise yet. Although I did Arnold, I did Arnold press instead of dumbbell side raise. These exercises, you can learn exactly what good technique looks like. So that is the piece of the puzzle that is a bit more challenging. You can learn through YouTube. You can hire a trainer. You can start to watch yourself in the mirror and just start to learn what excellent technique looks like. It does take an education. I will give you that, but it's absolutely worth it because when you master these nine exercises at these weight loads, I promise you're going to send me an email that says, Holly, I love you so much because my body feels so much better. It's taken me two years or 18 months, but I've mastered these nine moves and my life is so much better because of it. Questions and comments. Let me circle back around here because I know some questions came in. So bear with me and let me catch up here. 
Let's see here. Who all is here? Hollis, I'm addicted to Clamato juice. I hear you, but I'm purchasing the teas you recommended last week. Oh, that's exciting. I have a new um, shipment of Harney and Sons coming in, I think, today or tomorrow. And I've got white peach matcha. What else did I get? I got something new. I ordered a new tea from Harney and Sons that I haven't had before, and I'm totally forgetting on what it is. Hold on. We might have to wait and see what it is, but I know I got white peach matcha and I got two other, I think I got two other new teas. I might've gotten the green hot cinnamon spice on Heidi's recommendation, but then I think I got something else that was brand new. So stay tuned because next week I will be having a delicious new tea next week. Okay. Let's see here. So S N. Harris. I would guess that you will mention deadlift, shoulder press, and bent over row. SN Harris, who are you? Do I know you? Who are you? Um, that's hilarious because you know me well, so I must know you. I did deadlift. We did shoulder press. And bent over row was the ninth exercise that I actually decided to scrap and put in step ups instead. So I do think bent over row is a really, really good one too. Um, but lat pull down will cover the bases for bent over row. But if there was a 10th exercise, it would be bent over row. You know me very well. Um, that's not SN Harris. That's not Elizabeth, right? Shh. You'll tell me in a moment. I'll get down to the bottom of the comments here. Okay. Turo Turos. Leg press 90 pounds and going up. I will work on my goblet. I can do dumbbell side raise with five pounds for now. Beautiful. So as I said uh, at the top of this segment, leg press could be an alternate to goblet squat. Leg press gets tricky because every single machine is different. But I would say you want to reach about 100 pounds on a leg press. Total effort. Now, I've had leg press machines where the sled weighs 50 pounds, and I've had leg press machines where the sled weighs 15 pounds. So it depends on the piece of equipment that you're using, and therefore it's a little harder to say a minimum effective dose, but I would say about 100 pounds on a leg press if you're able to account for the differences in exercise equipment. Um, do you recommend these nine exercises all to be done together on the same day? No, they don't have to be. They could be. You could do all of these nine as a dedicated workout once or twice a week. You could definitely do that, but they don't have to be. So it really depends on what your strength programming is. And there's so many different kinds of strength programming, right? So if you're inside of one of my programs, that's why I do the programming for you, because I personally believe the magic is in the programming and the programming variables, the programming elements. And that's what I'm particularly good at. I'm really good at writing programming. So it depends on how you are creating your programming. And I've done live with Holly's on this in the past. Um, but I would say it doesn't matter as long as these movement patterns are in your workout routine in a given week and that you are slowly working up to these weight loads at some point. Like I don't do these nine exercises all in one workout. I do these nine exercises split between three workouts with some other exercises added in. I'm also not saying these are the only nine exercises that a woman should do. These are the top nine most important that you should be doing, unless you're more advanced, right? Some people are more advanced. Nelson Miles, you look like Blossom from the 90s. I don't know who that is. Okay, you need to look that one up. I'm going to take it as a compliment. It might not be, but I'm going to pretend it's a compliment. Petrina, I don't have a cable lap pull down, so anything I can sub when working at home. I imagine you heard me talk about my pull up. So that would be your assisted chin up. Technically, reverse grip chin up is what I like people to work on first. Um, Heidi said, lat pull down makes my back feel so good. I love them. And I couldn't agree more. For planks, Irene, if you have wrist issues, is it okay to use push-up handles to keep your wrists in a more neutral position? Absolutely. But similar to what I've mentioned about knees and hips, I would say 
Um, your wrist really should be able to handle a two minute plank. You should be able to get to a 90 degree angle weight bearing on your wrist. It might take time for you to get there, but I want your wrist mobility and your wrist stability and strength to be able to do this. So I would encourage you to gently, gently, naturally over time, work up to that. But if you also have a severe traumatic injury to a wrist, yes, you could use push-up handles so that you're holding this position. You could absolutely do that. Hollis, is this adjustable for age and or disability? I'm 70 and some of the exercises I used to do might aggravate spinal compression and osteoporosis. That said, I'm totally committed to daily exercise. So Hollis, I would say these numbers are for every woman, every single age, irrespective of spinal compression or osteoporosis. Now, that being said, you should take your time and you should safely and gradually, and maybe with the help of a professional, get up to these weight loads. But what I'm saying is, I believe even with osteoporosis and spinal compression issues, I believe if you learn good technique, you should be able to get to these levels. Now, I'm not telling you to do it on your own. I'm not telling you to do it haphazardly. I'm not telling you to do it next week. But I firmly believe that this is how you're going to rehab your body and become better at 74 or 75 or 80, right? Because ultimately, spinal compression and osteoporosis are the result of not keeping your lean muscle mass up. It really is. These are conditions of aging and an aging body and to some degree aging, um, to some degree, we can't completely avoid all aging. And therefore you do need to do this very carefully, very conservatively, very gently, progressively over time. But this is the direction that I want you going. And I personally don't believe that you know, again, listen, I'm not your doctor and I don't know your unique circumstance. And so I do want you to check in with your, you know, advisors that know your body for sure, because I don't know the nuances of your particular body. But in theory and in philosophy, I actually believe, let me say it differently. If I had spinal compression and I was, and I had, and I was diagnosed as osteoporosis, osteoporotic, I think it is right with osteoporosis. And I was 70, I would be doing these things. Okay. I can say it that way. I would be doing this if I had that exact circumstance, because I believe these are the things that are going to make me better. That being said, please do check in with a professional. Martin, Martin, that's a language I don't understand. If anybody else would like to interpret that for me, I'd love to answer it. Um, Sophie Living Fit. Hello, Julie. Love your points about the controversial exercises since I was wondering about my knees. I mean, use it or lose it. Right. Yes and no. I would say use it or lose, lose it, but you also have to be employing good technique. Technique is super, 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 super duper important. Hollis. There are many, many vendors. Hold on one second. Let me remove this one. Hollis, there are many, many vendors of exercise equipment. For those of us who have to buy additional equipment to follow this, do you recommend any preferred vendors? Um, I don't have specific preferred vendors um, because it's it's based on the exercise equipment. Um, yeah, it's if you're inside, I don't know if you're inside of one of my programs, but like in the glutes project, I think I share my favorites. Um but what I would say is all the brands do things differently and some brands do things better than others. Okay, I'll say it that way. And what I would offer is there is a brand out there by the name of CAP, C-A-P, Charlie Alpha Papa, Charlie Alpha Papa, C-A-P, CAP. I tend to like pretty much everything they make. Um, but... It just depends. It's a case by case, equipment by equipment situation. Sophie, 
my left shoulder has a little pain when I lift overhead and have limited movement range. So in that situation, for those of you, I would offer that you work on this with either light or no dumbbells so that you're really working on your range of motion first. This is something we talked about at length inside of Strength Society. I forget which one. Wherever we did overhead pressing, I think it was Strength Society 3. We talked about this and we workshopped this. You might have to work unloaded to increase your your range of motion before you load it. Petrina, what weight do you recommend for dumbbell overhead press? Minimum effective dosage, I would say, is 15 to 20 pounds. 15 to 20 pound dumbbells for one set of 15 with excellent technique. Facebook user, if you're still here, I know you moved the glutes project, but is the comeback workout no longer available? So um, if you are already a comeback member, you will always have access to it. If you are interested in joining the comeback, send me an email. It is still available. It's just a different... Um, it's a different offering right now, but if you want to join the comeback, you're not already a comeback member, just send me an email at holly at hollyperkins.com and I can guide you. But if you are in the comeback and you just need access to the programming, email me as well and I'll tell you how to get access to it. Uh, SN Harris is our specific height for step up. It's based on your body height. We also go over this in Strength Society. Martina, thanks for sharing your experience here. So generally one set of 15, but many sets do you recommend for each exercise? Yeah. So, you know, again, what we're talking about here is really like minimum effective dose. So yes, you're probably going to want to do more than one set of 15. Um, like I do three sets of some of these exercises or five sets of some of these exercises. This is just sort of like a barometer for the checkoff list of minimums. But yes, in terms of you know, building up your strength and more advanced programming. Generally, we do, we do offer, um, I do recommend more than one set of an exercise. And that's where we get into the nuances and the details and the art of programming. SN Harris is Nikki Harris. There we go. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. I knew I knew you, but I wasn't sure exactly who it was. And I was like, S, I was trying to put together S. Harris. And I'm like, S. Harris. Who's S. Harris? Got it. So glad you're here. Um, Hollis, I've been exercising for 50 years and sometimes things just happen. It's true. That said, nothing will stop me from exercising in the future, but now I'm going to do more of it with you. I love that, Hollis. High five. And that's great. And things do happen. Absolutely. And that's why for those of you guys that are working through joint issues or injuries or things like osteoporosis, right? Or spinal comp compression, please check in with your qualified professional who knows your body, right? Um, because I don't know your body. You know, I can, I can address these things with my private coaching clients. I can address these things with my masters, with people inside of some of my programs. But if I don't know your body, you've got to check in with your qualified professional. Yes, Hollis, you're correct. Uh, capbarbell.com. You can also find their stuff in... Uh, sporting goods stores, as well as Amazon. Oh, Janet. Yeah, just Janet. Are you inside of the comeback? I can't remember. You can email me. Just email me and I will I will get you squared away, whatever that means. Yeah. Um, generally speaking, how long are each episodes of Strength Society? So Strength Society, uh, they are approximately three to four hours. It's a workshop. So it's something where you're up and you're practicing and you're seeing other women demonstrate and you're refining your technique. So it's a workshop. Each workshop has five exercises and each, each workshop is anywhere between three and four hours, depending on what we're covering of those five exercises. Okay. And Sophie, it's Sophia, by the way, from Instagram. I know just in case you don't remember. I do. I totally remember. I know that's you. Okay. Any final questions or comments? This ended up being an awesome episode. I'm so glad that you guys were here. And it's so fun to hear that you guys were interested in this. If you're watching this in playback on YouTube, please say hello. Come over to my website, hollyperkins.com. Say hi. And if you're on my blog, send me an email and say hi, holly at hollyperkins.com. You can also follow me on Instagram at 
hollyperkins.com on Instagram. And if you want to join me live here, I'm here every Tuesday, one o'clock PM on the East coast for a brand new live episode. And we air only on Facebook, Holly Perkins Fitness on Facebook. I'll see you next time. Have a great day.